Hello everyone, once again, uh, I'm Kaibi Loa Crispin. I'm going to talk today about Hawaiian weapons. Um, for those of you who can speak a little Hawaiian in Hawaii and elsewhere, uh, Molina Ho, uh, Ovao no o Kaibi Loa Aupuni Kahula, no ho au i ke awa uh, i ka mainland, uh, i ka moku alikona, ili o Yavapai o Cottonwood, ke kaona. Uh, hey, kaula mai kai keia, uh, uh, ka mau poe o keia kaula he, he poe aloha. Uh, o ko'u uh, wahine uh, o napa kehau, kehau we call her. So let me go on now. Uh, Hawaiians use various things to make their weaponry. Some hardwoods that were available there in Hawaii, uh, one or two maybe not available elsewhere. Also shark's teeth, especially tiger shark's teeth, uh, sometimes stone weaponry. Uh, the other video is on Hawaiian stonework that tells how the stone was worked and how adzes were used to shape the wood and rubbing stones and so on. We'll make another video on tools and the use of the tools to make things like this. So let's start in over here. Uh, this is a real interesting one, a nasty little weapon. That was made with a cordage called Olana. I've used a substitute cordage here and three pretty good sized tiger shark teeth. So it's an eight ply braid and if you put that loop on your thumb like that and bring this cord around here and put this loop on your middle finger and then you bring this loop back around. This is just an extra piece of cordage as a brace and tuck it under here. You could get out of it pretty quick if you needed to. But see, you've got complete use of your hands. You can fight with your hands. And if you tighten your fist, you've got a vicious slashing weapon. So that wasn't very common. We know they did have things like that. And going on, some interesting weapons. Here's one that's a known Hawaiian weapon. People today call that a knuckle duster, based on those brass knuckle dusters. But look what a weapon that was. This one was made really beautifully of a type of wood called we call red kawila today. It's very, very hard wood. And look at the teeth. They all go in one direction. A shark's teeth go to the left on this side and to the right on this side. So if you catch a shark probably about seven feet long maybe that would have teeth this size, then you'd have the teeth going this way and this way. And most of these that are known have the teeth going both directions. So this one is not as good because you can only cut one way. So I think it's more like a show-off weapon because to make this the chief had to have two sharks exactly the same size in order to get this many teeth going to the right end of the steeply pointing outward pointer teeth we call and six more going that way the same way. So that's just an unusual weapon. Again, most of them would have the teeth going to the right or the left so it could cut either way in battle. This one is another typical shark's tooth weapon. This is made out of a wood called a kawai'e or kawai'a. And it's again got some pretty good sized tiger shark teeth. These are probably from a shark maybe about 10 feet long. It has a wrist loop here like this and it's loose so you could get out of it fast. And the lashing again would have been that, that uh, Olana cordage, real, real, real strong cordage made from an endemic plant in Hawaii, meaning it only grows in Hawaii. But there are various kinds of lashing. This one is very complex. It's got two strands through each hole and the strands go in between the teeth as well. So that the strands go all the way around, then a knot, then they go all the way around, then a knot, then all the way around, then all the way around. Four knots, four passes. So even if one got cut or broke, it's not going to come apart. And again, it's a vicious cutting weapon. So these woods, the one here uh, that I mentioned, quite a uh, is a beautiful hardwood. It was also used for tapa beaters to make the bark cloth. It was used for panels. So it's straight grain and really strong. 
It's not quite as hard as that Coahuila wood that I spoke of. This is a type of push dagger. The one that's known like this from Hawaii was really bigger, about 14 inches long. But look at the form of this. It's got a ball in here. The Coahuila wood that this is made of can be made needle sharp, and it'll hold that point in. It's really a hard wood. So it's used in the hand like this, into the palm, as a thrusting weapon. And it's got a vicious barb so that if this was pushed into someone, it's not going to come out. And so this would be, I think, more like an uh, assassin's weapon, something that could be hidden under your top of cloth kihei, it was a shoulder wrap, uh, or some, way, some other way hidden. It's not a very big weapon like you would use in battle. This one is interesting. Again, I made that one out of kawaii wood. It's got the typical handle, and usually the weapons had the handle somewhere near the middle so that you could use both ends of the weapon. Also, you could get out of the loop real fast if you have to in battle or just let it drop. So that way it stays with you in fighting if you have to use both hands. This one only has two teeth, so that would suggest maybe a, a much lesser chief. No commoner would have these shark's teeth, a too valuable an item. But a lesser chief might have just two teeth. And so the way that this is lashed in here is to put cordage down into a hole that meets another hole and comes up the other way. So it's a very difficult way of lashing, very rare. And the other thing about this weapon is it's still got the flat markings from using an adze, which we'll talk about again. And it's also uh, in one of the earlier talks. But the adzing will leave these flats and then Later on, if, it's, if, if grinding snows, as we're going to talk about, abrading snows smooth this all down until it's really smooth, it looks great, but it's not as easy to hold, especially in battle, if your hands were all sweaty or bloody in battle. These flutes that go down the sides or flats give a much, much better grip. So we'll talk later about this type of lashing. That actually came to me in a dream, like a vision-like dream, how to lash that. And then we're going to go on with some of these other things, and then I'll move over to the other side. This one is really interesting. This is also a known Hawaiian weapon. Really crazy wild compared to other things in Polynesia. It's just like that. It's got a hand guard. It's got four long stingray barbs that are armoring the point. And so I was lucky enough to see that and to measure it. And then I made an exact replica. It's 14 and a quarter inches long. It has a really fine cordage here that ties these together. And it's, it's glued in place, too. The Hawaiians had some glues in the old times. They're pretty good glues. But there's a little bit of wrap here and a little bit of wrap here. And the very fine teeth that are on the stingray barb will hold the wraps in place. And this type of cordage is from a plant material called mamaki in Hawaii. It's very, very thin, very, very strong, dark colored like this, but also very flexible, so it's easy to tie it. And this is real, real fine, delicate coconut cordage. Set it, it's braided, set it. I didn't make that. It probably came from some true expert, maybe in the far reaches of Samoa. Again, this one is made out of that wood called kawai'e or kawai'a. It's a good, strong, real close grained wood. And this copies probably a Spanish weapon from the 1500s or 1600s. They would have a cup-like hand protector right here that was made of open work iron. And maybe, for all we know, the Hawaiians had some kind of a gourd piece on here to copy that. But it makes quite a weapon, and it's very unique. But it really is a known Hawaiian weapon. Now, what about this one? What about that tooth? That's, that's a great white shark tooth. And probably, if it's inch and a half wide like that. That shark's going to be about 13 feet long and weigh about 3,500 pounds. A magnificent and ferocious beast. So this one is pegged in place instead of tied in place, and that was a good way. As long as you've got enough of a base to the tooth and you can flatten the tooth and make a slot to get it set in there, you could drill through the tooth ahead of time and then drill through the outside and put pegs through there to hold it in place. But look where this is. This is a node piece from Hawaii. It's a copy of a node piece. And here I used a wood really, really hard called kawila. And this is the other kind of kawila called dark kawila. 
but the head, the, the lash here is, is back at the back, the loop. So this is more like to hang this up somewhere. And so that suggests that it was a tool instead of a weapon, because usually, as I said, the weapons will have this in the middle, so you could get out of it, and when you're gripping it here, you can fight both ways. You can use it like this and as your slashing tool. But you're dependent on just one point. If it broke in battle, you'd be really stuck. But you could sure do some serious cutting with this if it was just a tool. So we don't know. Probably it was a tool and a weapon. This is what's called a truncheon dagger. That means it's a club on one side and a dagger on the other side. It's kind of a little diamond shape and cross section. It's got a facsimile of an Olana cordage loop here. So it was used every which way like this, back behind you or this way, stabbing. And that's a, called a trench of dagger in English. This is a known Hawaiian weapon and it's used from a swordfish bill. The swordfish has an incredibly strong bill. It has a certain amount of flexibility. And a big one, a swordfish can run it right through the planks of a boat without breaking its bill. So the Hawaiians favored that. Um, this one has got some real fine wrapping on here that I put on there, just a fancy wrap with some gum on there. The Hawaiians had glue type materials to hold, would hold it in place, but give you a really good grip in battle. So that's a smaller one, a distinctly smaller one, but that's the swordfish bill. This is from a type of wood called Alahe'e, usually it's small, occasionally it grows big. It's really, really hard. And that was a bush that burned in a fire, and I found that. And decided not to cut it because a really powerful man, more powerful than me, could really wield this to tremendous effect in battle. So it's really hard. It's not going to break. It's not going to dent. It takes a beautiful polish. That's Alahe'e wood. Now here's something that's often seen today in replicas of Hawaiian weaponry. And that's the Marlin Bill. Great weapon, another truncheon dagger type weapon. The trouble is that there aren't any of these in the collections and Captain Cook and others didn't pick these up early on that I know of. And I haven't heard of anybody except maybe one person that thought they had seen one of these in a collection. So why would the Hawaiians not make weapons out of Marlin Bills? Maybe because it was harder for them to catch the great big Marlins, that's possible because it makes a fabulous weapon. Um, but also, it doesn't have the cutting edge that the swordfish bill has. The cutting, the cutting edge, like a knife blade, would make it extremely easy to stab with or to cut with. And my thought is probably that they simply preferred the swordfish uh, over the marlin. This is another type of pahoa, or dagger, and mimics the type that was from Kauai. Um, it's got some light streaks in here, and the wood kawila means the lightning. So the light streaks in the heartwood like that probably reminded Hawaiians of lightning, and that's where it got that name. I've carved a little warrior's head on the end of this one just because that's what came to mind when I made that. So all of these things I've made with the exception of two, that long swordfish uh, weapon I did not make, and there's one other thing over here that I did not make. Um, this one is a different one called Uhi Uhi. That's another one that's really, really hard. So of the hard ones, Olapua or Pua, and Uhi Uhi and Kawila, either the dark one or the red one, were used to make the weaponry. So this is really a true dagger. It's not a trenchant dagger. It's really not, you could strike with it on this end, but it's really a dagger weapon. It really has a needle-like point. So if you were armed with that and this, if you had this in your left hand to parry with and stab with, and this in your right hand as a sword, you'd be armed a lot like an old-time Spaniard from the 1500s or so. Their sword would have been a slimmer one than this. But interestingly enough, none of the other Polynesians had daggers, just the Hawaiians. So this one is one more. This is Kawila wood, too. And this is more what you call a trench of dagger and it's and approaching the longer ones that were called Laau Palau. But this was Kawila, it had a naturally burned 
piece here, and that's I just made where probably the tree had gone through one fire and then managed to put out a branch again. I put a tooth in here, which sometimes were in Hawaiian weapons and bowls to insult someone. And it has that diamond-shaped point on this end. So it could be used in the same way, striking, parrying, all sorts of ways. This way, this way, this way, this way. A really nasty weapon with good weight, and the Kawila wood is really strong and really tough. These are going to get into what are called nevas. A neva is some kind of a club, so this is just some kind of hardwood, a piece of driftwood. I put a little loop on that one. Pretty good club, fits in my hand pretty good, but pretty lightweight, hard enough though for battle. And so commoners, you know, constricted to fight in battles, they would certainly have had plenty of clubs like that. Now let's go over here. This one just was just interesting to me. Now that's another piece of Kawila, and it's not very pretty, it's not straight, but it looked like it kind of had an ear right here and a face here. And so in the hard part, the middle part of the wood there, I carved a face because I've seen a weapon, a, a, a weapon or two that had faces. I restored one one time. And this one has a curve, and it fits perfectly in the hand of a right-handed person. I didn't put a loop on that one, but it's just a perfect weapon for a right-handed person. So you get a heavy blow her temple or liver kind of strike, the stabbing weapon, and just plain old clubbing like that. This is another type of neva in which a wooden handle, this is kuwa'e, kuwa'e once again, some sedit, that's coconut cordage, and a four-sided head. See that? So the lashing is protected by the, the extensions of the four-sided head, and then the handle went up into a little hollow in the bottom of the stone head to give it more stability. But that's called a neva, and it's a two-piece neva, part stone and part wood. Here's the head of a great big neva that I made. That's, that took the longest of any stone thing I ever made, stone on stone. Made only with that stone right there. And the total time to make that head was 31 hours. And I didn't even hollow the base. It would take another hour or so to hollow the base. This is called a pekoi. And so this is also a head club, easily enough, right? A good club. But oftentimes this would have a long braided, or, or say four, four, eight ply braided Olonok cord so that the expert could throw this sort of like a bouncing yo-yo and use it as a tripping club. So it would spin around the feet of the combatants, say they were running across the battlefield in front of an expert that had something like this. They could flip this out, make it spin around the legs of the combatant and down. they'd be down and they'd be out real fast that way. This one is real interesting because there's a record from the 1920s. Somebody found a cave at Haleakala Crater on Maui, and it talked about having a lot of hand axes in there. There was a whole stockpile of weapons probably to try to fight against King Kamehameha if ever the chance came again. But it has a lot of wear around the handle and almost no wear here on the edge. And that means it was not a bread flute splitter. It was not a tool. It was a weapon. So I think what they were talking about, hand axes or hand hatchets, that's the only known example that I've ever seen or heard of. But I think that's it right there. Did the Hawaiians use bows like this? No. The bows were used for a, a sport for the elites to shoot at little rats, just a sport. And they did not use bows as weapons. But they did use spears. This spear here is called an ihe, and that was more of a javelin. So it was usually about six to eight feet long. And if it had all these fancy barbs on the end, it was called an ihe laumeki, or laumeti. And it was designed to break off. If it went into some combatant, it was designed to break off. It may be made of koa wood, sometimes of the kawila wood, but these that were carved like this were probably made of koa wood all the time. And the last thing here is the pololu, and that's a pike. That's this one here. It usually had some kind of fancy handle at the bottom, maybe just crude, but sometimes fancy like that one. 
made of cowila, so it could be used as a pole vaulting thing, if necessary, to jump across a ditch or something in battle. And it had various kinds of points, but usually just a sort of a spear point type point like that. And it was about 12 to 15 feet long. Ordinarily, that one is only about 10 feet long because that's all the wood I had. And uh, that's all I could get into a vehicle to take it to a show and tell type of talk. So that's the story on Hawaiian weapons. And we'll get into another uh, video about how the weapons, weapons were made and another video about all the tools that were used to make these weapons. Mahalo.